Okay, so before we start, I just have two announcements. The first one is about the final project. It's already up, as I'm sure you've seen. The project is supposed to be extremely hard. You are not supposed to be able to solve all of it. That's not the point of that project. So even if you solve parts of it, if you have some of the guarantees, you will very likely get a very high mark there. So don't worry about being able to do everything in the project. Of course, if you can do everything correctly there, I will be very impressed. Uh, so that's the first announcement. And yeah, don't worry about your grades. Even if you don't get uh, all of the points in the project, you're going to you're going to be fine. Like no one will get all the points there. Hopefully, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, the second point is about SFQs, student feedback questionnaire. This is opened on Canvas. Please take part. Uh, this is actually the second year that I'm offering this course. And from next year, we want to turn it into a regular course. And we actually need more than 85% participation in the SFQs in order for this course to become a regular course. Right now, we are at 3%. So <laughs> I need 82 percentage points there. Please take part. I don't care what you think about the course. Okay, sorry, no. I do care what you care, what you think about the course, but I care much more that you actually take part in the SFQ. So even if you hate the course, take part. I need the 85% there, okay? So with that being said, uh, oh, one more announcement. I have received a lot of emails from you guys that I have not answered yet. Sorry, there's just too many of them. It will take some time, okay. Now, finally, let's start the lecture. So today we're going to talk about some assumptions that we have because we are just very much used to the idea of using RSA for our encryption and signatures. And I'm going to show you some other crypto systems that just don't have the same assumptions as RSA. Now, the reason I'm doing this is to set up the scene for, to, for the next lecture, not tomorrow's. Uh, for the next lecture where we will actually talk about zero knowledge proofs. And so this lecture doesn't really stand on its own. The first assumption that we are kind of used to during this whole course is that our encryption and signatures and everything is deterministic. So if you think about RSA, for example, if I give you a message and you want to encrypt it using RSA, you have a unique encryption of the message. And the algorithm that you have to encrypt the message is also deterministic. There is nothing probabilistic in that algorithm. There is only one possible encryption. And then the same thing happens when you think about decryption or in case of RSA, when you think about signatures. So if you're using RSA and you want to sign a particular message, there is a unique signature on that message. Right, so you just take your message, raise it to the power of your private key, that's the signature. Again, this is not something that is necessary for us. Remember when we were talking about encryption and digital signatures, we didn't have a requirement on uniqueness. So the requirement I had for encryption was that if I encrypt something and then I decrypt it, I should get the same thing back. So I can have many different encrypted forms. Right. And the requirement on signatures was that no one should be able to forge them. And if I sign a document or some message, then anyone else should be able to verify that the signature came from me. Again, there is no reason for this signature to be unique. I can have millions of different signatures that are valid for the same message as long as no one else can create one of them. Okay. So today we're going to first see some examples where uh, the encryption and the signature process itself is probabilistic. And then we also had another assumption that came very much from RSA. And it was this assumption that signing is pretty much like decrypting. So I don't know if you remember it that far back, but we talked about this idea that in RSA, in order to decrypt a message, you needed to know the private key. and so decryption was something that only the person who has the private key could do. And then when we were talking about signatures, we said that, okay, so I have another action, the action of signing here that I want only one person to be able to do, right? And then our intuition was, let's make it so that signing is the same as decryption. 
and that intuition worked for RSA, we will see that it doesn't necessarily work for all the other crypto systems. Okay, so the first crypto system I wanna talk about today is the Goldwasser Mikali crypto system. And of course it's named after the people who invented it. And this is going to be an example of a system with probabilistic encryption. So if I give you one message and you want to encrypt it, you can have many different encrypted results. But before I get into this, I have to talk a little bit about uh, number theory again. And specifically, I have to define the concepts of a quadratic residue. Okay, this is actually quite easy. So let's say that I'm doing all of my calculations modulo some number, modulo n. I say that uh, some integer, so let's say x, which is between 0 to n minus 1, is a quadratic residue. And I'm going to write it as qr modulo n. If, very simply, if there exists a y such that y squared is congruent to x modulo n. So I say x is a quadratic residue if x is the square of some other number, except that all of my calculations are modulo n. Okay. Now, if I give you a prime number, if n is a prime number, it's actually quite easy to figure out if a particular X is a quadratic residue or not. So this is sometimes called the quadratic, I can't even pronounce this, residuosity. Uh, how do they even write it? Yeah. This is the... This is the name of the problem, the quadratic residuosity problem. Basically gives you two numbers, x and n, and asks you if x is a quadratic residual modulo n. Okay, so this is the problem given n and x. Is x a quadratic residual? Modular. And this is one of those problems that is actually hard. So remember, generally, when we talk about crypto systems, we want to say that you cannot break this particular encryption unless you can solve a hard problem that no one knows how to solve. And this is the hard problem that we're going to work with today. So if I give you a number n and some number x and assume that n and x are huge. So let's say n is 1024 bits long. I really have no way of knowing whether x is a quadratic residual module n. We don't have good algorithms. It doesn't mean that good algorithms don't exist. Mathematically, they might exist. We just don't know much. Okay, but actually the problem is quite easy if n is a prime. So this is easy case. Number one, if n is a prime. Actually, since it's a prime, let, let me just switch my notation and show it with p instead of n. So if I give you some number x, and I ask you whether x is a quadratic residue modulo a prime number p, how can you answer that? We actually have a, a very simple test for this. It goes back to Fermat's little theorem again. So remember what Fermat's little theorem said. Fermat's little theorem said that for every a that is not zero, a to the power of p minus one is congruent to, what did it say? It's congruent to what? 
a to the power of p minus one is congruent to? Oh, come on. Yes, answer, someone tell me. One? Modulo p? Okay. Yeah. So if a to the power of p minus one is always one modulo p, how can I use this to check whether a particular x is let's say a squared? So here's a very simple intuition. If x is of the form y squared, okay, how many times should I multiply x by itself in order to get one? So here's the thing. If I take any number and I multiply it by itself p minus one times, I'm guaranteed to get one, okay? If this number happens to be uh, a power of, uh, if this number happens to be a square, a square of another number, if it's a quadratic residue, then how many times should I multiply x by itself in order to get one? Just p minus one over two, right? So I just compute. I, I know that if x is some y squared, if there exists a y such that x is y squared, then x to the power of p minus one over two is going to be congruent to one modulo p. Okay? And actually it's quite easy to show that this is if and only if. Okay, and the, the way you show that is you just take uh, a primitive root G, and if you take a primitive root, you can create the cycle of all the powers of this primitive root. And then all the elements that are at an even position in that cycle, if you raise them to the power of P minus one over two, you will get one, and all the odd placed elements, you will not get one. So. Uh, x is a quadratic residue, if and only if x to the power of p minus one over two is congruent to one modulo p. So this problem is super easy if you are given a prime number p. If I give you a prime number p and some number x, and I ask you whether x is a quadratic residue, you just raise x to the power of p minus one over two, and by the way, this is, taking, this is taking log p time, right? Because I can do uh, fast exponentiation. So super easy, even if p is a large number. And then I just check if this is one. And that tells me whether uh, uh, this number x was a q or not. Okay. Another easy case is actually if you know the, uh, prime factorization of the number n. So let me do this one. Easy case number two is if n equals p times q and p and q are prime numbers. And let's say that we know the factorization and we know p and q. Again, I've given you some number x, and I'm asking you, is x the square of some other number modulo n? And you also know that n is p times q. And you know how to check if x is a square modulo p and if x is a square modulo q, right? So basically, we, the algorithm is very simple. Let's say, let's say there exists a y such that x is equal to y squared modulo n. What does this mean? This means that of course, x is equal to y squared modulo p, and x is also equal to y squared modulo q. So if x, is a quadratic residue modulo n, it has to be a quadratic residue modulo both p and q. And we can check each one of these easily. 
right? So this one and this one, they are easy to check. So I just check these two. And if any of these checks fail, if X is not a square modulo P or modulo Q, then I know it's not a square modulo N. And I just say, no, I return no. What if both of these checks pass? What if X is a square modulo P and it's also a square modulo Q? Now, the problem is that it might be a square modulo of both P and Q, but not the square of the same thing, right? So I might have a situation like this. I might have X is equal to Y1 squared modulo P, but it's equal to some other number, Y2 squared modulo Q, right? So it's a square when I'm looking at uh, numbers modulo P and also when I'm looking at them modulo Q, but it's not the square of the same thing. What can I do in this case? Okay, so this is one of the things that I actually told you to self-study and now I'm saying that very few people did. Uh, this is where we can use the Chinese remainder theorem. And what this says is that there exists some number y and this number y is between zero to n minus one, such that y is equal to y1 modulo p and y is equal to y2 modulo q. Okay. So basically for any two remainders, modulo P and modulo Q, I will have a unique remainder modulo P times Q. I don't even need the uniqueness here. I just need the existence. So there is some number Y modulo N that is equal to Y1 modulo P and it's equal to Y2 modulo Q. So I can take this Y and then Y squared is equal to X modulo N. So if X is a, square modulo P, and if it's also a square modulo Q, if it's a quadratic residual modulo both P and Q, then it's also a quadratic residual modulo N. Okay, great. So now I have the second easy case. If N is P times Q, I can just do these two checks and I can know if X is a QR. But the hard part, is actually this part. The hard part is knowing P and Q, right? I can do this test only if I know the prime factorization of N. And if I don't know the prime factorization of N, and if N is a large number, I don't know how to factorize it. And so I cannot apply this easy check here. So that's why this problem is actually a really hard problem. In general, if I'm just given some number n without its prime factorization, and I'm given some number x, and someone is asking me, is x a quadratic residual modulo n? I can't answer that. I don't have a good algorithm for it. Okay? So even though we have these easy cases, this second easy case especially, it depends on knowing the prime factorization. And we want to use this to design our crypto system. So, you see, most of the time when I'm designing some crypto system, I'm trying to find a problem that is really hard if you don't have a particular piece of information. And then I'm going to put that piece of information as my secret key. So I want to design some sort of a crypto system such that decrypting actually needs to solve this problem. And then I'm going to say, if Alice is the person who has the private key and she's the person who can decrypt, only she knows the P and Q, only she knows how to factorize them. And if then other people don't know how to do the factorization, other people cannot answer this question. And then I want to make sure that in order to decrypt, you have to answer this question, this problem. Okay, that's the intuition. So based on this, 
I can finally tell you what the Goldwasser Mikali system actually does. Okay. So just like RSA, we have to start with generating our keys. So this is a public key cryptography system. So let's say that as usual, I have one person, Alice. And what Alice is going to do is that she's first going to generate some keys. She's going to announce her public key to the vault so that everyone knows her public key. And then anyone should be able to send Alice messages and only Alice should be able to decrypt them using her secret key. Okay. So let's start with the key generation. I shall be writing black. So we want to use the hard QR problem. So I'm going to say in step one, Alice picks two really large prime numbers. I'm going to call them P and Q. And let's say that she sets N to be P times Q. Now this N is actually going to be public. I'm back to using red for private and blue for public. So the knowledge that Alice is keeping to herself is the prime factorization of this number N and N is a huge number. Okay. Additionally, she's going to find another integer. So step two, Alice finds some X and this X is going to be an integer modulo N. So between zero, one to N minus one. But I want this X to not be a QR. I want to make sure X is not a QR. So I find an X such that uh, X is not a quadratic residue modulo P and it's also not a quadratic residue modulo Q. How do I find such an X? Well, I know how to check if a particular value is a quadratic residue modulo P, right? Because P is a prime number. So I just pick random values of X and I test. And I do this until I find an X that is not a quadratic residue modulo P and also not a quadratic residue modulo Q. And again, I forgot my coloring scheme here. So P and Q were supposed to be in red and actually, Modulo P, modulo Q, and this X is going to be public. So now we're finally at the point where we can say what the public key is. So step three, Alice publishes X and N as her public key. Okay, so here Alice is just going to tell the entire world, here's my public key. It has two parts, here's X, here's N. So anyone who wants to send messages to Alice knows these two values. Now the rest of the world, they know N, but they don't know the factorization of N. And actually that factorization is going to be the private key. So she publishes her public key, and uses the factorization PQ as her secret key. Okay. So if you're someone who wants to send a message to Alice, what do you know at this point? You know that there is some big number N and only Alice knows the prime factorization of N. 
okay? And you also know some number X and Alice is guaranteeing to you that X is not a QR modulo N. It's not a quadratic residual modulo N. But generally you cannot check if any other number is a quadratic residual modulo N or not because that's a hard problem. And because you don't know P and Q. So we want to use this kind of information to now send a message to Alice, okay? So let's say Bob has a message. Okay. It's really hard to draw these things. So Alice has P and Q here. Let's say Bob has a message M and he wants to send this message M to Alice, okay? And let's say that Bob has encoded this message as a series of bits. So I'm going to show this with M1, M2 to let's say MK. So each one of these MIs is a bit and Bob wants to send this message M to X. Now what I'm going to do here is actually very genius. And uh, this was, uh, uh, this crypto system is actually older than RSA. So here's the thing, I have a bunch of bits. I have M1 to MK, each one of them is either zero or one. I'm going to send each bit separately. I'm going to encrypt each bit separately. And the way I'm going to encrypt it is that I know Alice is the only person who can check whether a particular number is a quadratic residual modulo n. So if M1 is zero, I'm going to send Alice a number that is not a quadratic residual modulo n. And if M1 is one, I'm going to send a number that is a quadratic residual modulo n. Okay, and then only Alice can check that. So only Alice can know if this bit was zero or one. Now, of course you can switch it around. You can say, I, I use residues for zero and non-residues for one or the other way around. It's up to you. But that's the whole point. So I'm going to basically send K versions of this problem to Alice. And I know that only Alice can solve this problem. So the answer to these K versions of this problem, whether a particular number is, is a quadratic residue or not, are going to give Alice the bits that I want to send to her. Okay. So this is how encryption works. Now I'm going to go into much more detail. So let's say Bob wants to send a message M to Alice. And this message M is again M1, M2 to MK. And here's the part where things get even more interesting. The encryption is not going to be unique. Bob is going to be able to do this probabilistically. So for the same message, I'm going to have many different possible encryptions. Okay, so here's what Bob does. For every I, for every bit basically, Bob just picks one random number modulo n. So for every I, Bob picks some number, I'm going to call it yi, and this yi is going to be a number modulo n. And I'm also going to require that uh, it's relatively prime to n. So such that yi, uh, or I can write it like this, gcd of yi and n is one. Okay. Now this yi, it's just a, randomly pick number. That's why I say it's probabilistic. So maybe let me put randomly here as well. Now here's what Bob does. Bob computes some other number. I'm going to call this CI. And CI is going to use this YI and the ice bit of the message. So it's going to be this, it's going to be yi squared 
times x to the power of the i spit of the message. Okay, what's happening here? I have this number CI. Now let's see if CI is a quadratic residue. I hit some random yi, so yi squared is definitely, of course, a square. That's by definition. But this x here, x was not a square, right? That was uh, part of the requirements when the key generation was happening. I said Alice finds an x such that x is not a quadratic residue. It's not a square modulo either p or q. So since x is not a square, and yi squared is a square, when would ci be a square? And by the way, mi is either zero or one. So if mi is zero, ci would be a square. It would be a quadratic residue modulo n. If mi is one, ci will not be a square. Okay? So that's it. Bob does this and sends CI to Alice. And I'm writing CI in this color because I'm assuming that when he's sending this to Alice, we can have all sorts of adversaries who can actually see the message, right? So I'm assuming that CI is public, but again, YI was never leaked. So Bob is going to send C1, C2 to CK to Alice. Let's call the entire thing C. Okay, but now at this point, I don't even have to tell you about the decryption. It's so obvious now. So the decryption is that Alice just looks at every one of these CIs to create the I spit of the message. So again, here it is for every I, Alice checks whether CI is a quadratic residue modulo n. And again, the important point is that I know only Alice can do this check. No one else can do it. Now, there are two cases. If, if yes, if CI is a quadratic residue, what does that mean? That means MI was zero. Then MI is zero. Otherwise, MI is one. So Alice can decrypt the message bit by bit. And only Alice can do this decryption. And again, when I say only Alice can do this decryption, this is assuming that no one knows how to solve this problem, which is a correct assumption as of this moment. No one knows how to solve this problem without knowing the prime factorization. And since only Alice knows the prime factorization, she can do this and she can decrypt everything. So now you see, this is a very different system from what we're used to. This is very different from RSA. And really the main difference here is in the way that encryption is done. I don't have a unique encryption. So just think of every one of the bits. For every one of the bits, Bob is randomly picking a YI. So Bob has many different choices for what YI he wants to pick. He can pick whichever he likes. So the same message can have many different encryptions. And it's probabilistic. It's up to Bob to decide how to encrypt it. But in any case, when you encrypt a message, no matter which one of the encryptions you get, when you decrypt it again, you will get the original message back, which is the property that we really cared about. Okay. But this crypto system actually has another really nice property. So here's the really nice property. This is what we call homomorphic encryption. And actually, RSA has something similar too.
let's think of a single bit. So we're sending each one of our bits separately. So it's basically a bit by bit encryption system. Uh, so let's say that I encrypt just a single bit. So let's say I encrypt a single bit B1. Now I'm writing it like this, but my encryption is not a function. It can output many different encryptions, right? So I, I have a random choice. So when I write it like this, just imagine any of the results of the encryption of B1. Okay, so if I encrypt B1, and if I encrypt another number, another bit, B2, what happens if I multiply the result of their encryption? So the encryption of B1 is a number that satisfies this property. It's a quadratic residue if and only if B1 is zero. The encryption of B2 is a quadratic residue only if B2 is zero. What happens if I multiply two numbers like this? So this is where we again use some basic number theory. If I multiply two quadratic residues, of course I get another quadratic residue, right? That's easy to see. If you, you multiply two squares, you will get another square. If I multiply a square and a non-square, I will get a non-square. But the nice point, and for this, I'm going to just refer you to a number theory book, is that if I multiply two non-squares, I will get a square. So the encryption of B1 multiplied by the encryption of B2 actually gives me the encryption of B1 XOR with B2. This is the homomorphic property of Goldwasser Mikado. Now, why is this nice? Figure it out in your project. You can use this in your project. But very importantly, look here. I have two encrypted variants. I have an encryption of E1 and an encryption of P2. And I don't need to decrypt them in order to perform XOR. So I can do calculations on encrypted material, right? I have two messages, B1 and B2. I don't have the original messages. I only have their encryption. And I can get the encryption of their XOR without knowing B1 or B2, without first decrypting, doing the XOR and then encrypting again. I can just work with the encrypted versions. This is called uh, the homomorphic property of Goldwasser Mikal. Now, actually, we have kind of a similar property in RSA. So uh, if I let me erase this one and let's just say homomorphic property of Goldwasser Mikali. Now, what happens if I do something similar in RSA? So let's say I'm using RSA and I take the encryption of some message, M1, and I take the encryption of another message, M2, and I multiply them together. What do I get? So remember the encryption of M1 was M1 to the power of some uh, number E, and this number E was the public key in RSA. Right, it, this was the encryption key. And then the encryption of M2 is just M2 to the power of E. So if I multiply them, I take I get M1, M2 to the power of E. So in the case of RSA, if I multiply two encrypted messages, I get the encryption of M1 multiplied by M2. Okay, so we have kind of a similar property in RSA. It's not as nice as that one. We can't really do XOR. We can do multiplication. Okay. Uh, and actually, this can be the basis for some attacks. 
So imagine uh, in the case of RSA, especially, this also works for decryption. So it works for signatures in RSA. So if I give you a signature on M1 and I give you another signature on M2, you can multiply my signatures together and you can get a signature on M1 times M2. So whenever you're designing any kind of protocol that uses RSA, you have to be careful about this. You have to be careful that even though people cannot forge your signatures, if you give them two signatures on two messages, they can forge your signature on their product. And well, here for Goldwasser Mikali, we don't really have the same property. It's just the XOR. And actually this is useful again for your project. Okay. Now I want to go back. We have like 10 minutes. And I want to talk a little bit about LGML encryption again. And this was something that we saw again at the beginning of this course. The LGML crypto system. We saw that it was basically a variant of TP Now, the reason I'm bringing this up again is to show you that this idea that we had in RSA that we can just use decryption as a way of signing is not going to really work with LGML. Okay, so very fast overview of how LGML worked. So remember we had Alice and what she did was that she chose a very big modulus and the modulus was actually a prime number. So she chose a big prime number P and then, okay, let me do it like this. So Alice chose some big prime number P and then she chose a secret A and we had a primitive root or generator G and she published G to the power of A. That's what we did in LGML. So the public key that Alice would give to everyone was just P and G to the power of A. And all the calculations were modulo P. And then if Bob wanted to send a message to Alice, so this is Bob, he has a message M that he wants to send to Alice. He would basically do everything that we did in Diffie-Hellman. So he would first choose some secret B and then he would compute G to the power of AB, right? So G to the power of AB. And the way he could compute this was that he had G to the power of A from Alice and he could just raise that to the power of B and then he had G to the power of AB. And G to the power of AB was the shared secret between Alice and Bob. And then he would just send G to the power of B and his message M plus G to the power of AB to Alice. And remember here what happened was that Alice now has G to the power of B from Bob. She knows A, she can raise G to the power of B to the power of A so that she gets G to the power of AB. And then she can just subtract it from this part to get M. Okay, this was El Gamal. Again, if you need a refresher on this, just go back and watch that lecture. I just want you to see that the idea of using uh, this kind of uh, decryption as signature doesn't really work here. So let's say that Alice has this private key A and she has this public key P and G to the power of A. How can Alice sign something? Okay. You see, we don't really have that. I cannot have a situation here. Uh, I will talk about these kinds of signatures uh, in the next session. But the idea that we had in RSA that signing is going to be basically the same as decryption doesn't really work here because this protocol is actually kind of interactive. You see, if Alice wants to sign M, it's not just a matter of decryption because decryption itself is not just something that Alice does. It's interactive. Bob has to send 
this message g to the power of b and n plus g to the power of a d to Alice before Alice can decrypt anything. Right? So the decryption is not just dependent on the value of m, it's also dependent on the inputs that are given by Bob, which is g to the power of b and g to the power of a plus b. So Alice cannot just do it on her own. She cannot just create a signature the way that we saw in ours. But the nice point here is that decryption here actually solves one of the homework problems. Unfortunately, it's too late for you. You cannot resubmit that homework anymore. Uh, but here's the thing. Suppose that Alice wants to prove to Bob that she knows a value of A such that g to the power of a is this particular value, okay? So let's show g to the power of a, let's give it a new name. Let me call it, I don't know. Let, let me call it x, okay? So x is public, everyone knows x. And Alice wants to prove to Bob that she knows a value of a such that g to the power of a is equal to x, okay? Alice wants to prove that she knows some value of A such that G to the power of A is equal to X modulo P. And everyone knows X and everyone knows P. She wants to prove this, but she wants to make sure that she doesn't leak the value, okay? So the simplest way of proving, of course, would be to just give the value of A to Bob. Bob can raise G to the power of A and check if it's correct or not. But the important point is that Alice wants to do this without leaking any information about A. Okay, so this is not really the same as signing anything. It's just that Alice wants to prove her knowledge. And this can be done by decryption now. So the way I would do it if uh, I'm Alice is I just tell Bob, okay, send me any message. Encrypt some message M, choose a random message M, encrypt it and send me the encrypted format. And I will decrypt it for you. And I will send you the decrypted version. And since decrypting here needs knowledge of A, Bob would be sure that Alice actually knows A because otherwise Alice cannot decrypt, right? But again, this is an interactive protocol. We have to have Bob do something first. Bob has to first choose the message M and then encrypt it using that formula, G to the power of B and M plus G to the power of AB and send it to Alice. And then if Alice can decrypt it and send the same message M back to Bob, if Alice sends M back to Bob, then Bob can be sure that Alice knows A. And of course they can repeat this as many times as they like so that Alice can really prove to Bob that she knows A. Now, this is uh, the setting that we will talk about much more in the coming sessions. This is what we call a zero knowledge proof. So Alice is proving to Bob that she knows something, that she knows a value of A that satisfies this particular equation, but she's not giving any information about A to Bob. So what is Bob receiving from Alice? The only thing Bob is receiving from Alice is this message M back. And this was something that Bob knew already, right? Because Bob created that. So there is no way Bob is getting any new information. That's why we call it zero knowledge. But we are proving to Bob that Alice knows A. So that's the proof part of zero knowledge. Okay, we will see many more zero knowledge proofs in the coming sessions. Uh, yeah, so the, the really nice point here was that if you take RSA, you could use the decryption in RSA as a way of signing. But if you take L-gamal instead, you can use the decryption in L-gamal as a way of providing zero knowledge proofs.